Hi everyone, this is Carol Hinkle. Welcome. I can't believe this is our seventh lecture. Wow. What a glorious day. If you haven't gone out, this might be the last beautiful day. I would love to now take the opportunity to please introduce Beth Wood. She's our program chair and she will introduce today's speaker. Beth. Hello everyone. It's my pleasure today to welcome our speaker, Christopher Kirkey. Chris earned his bachelor's and master's from Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario, and his PhD from Brandeis, and all of his degrees are, from, are in political science. In 2002, Chris joined the faculty at the State University of New York at Plattsburgh, and he is currently a professor of political science there, as well as director of the, study for the, set, director of the Center for the Study of Canada. You may also recognize Chris from his appearances on Vermont This Week, on Vermont Public Broadcasting System, Vermont PBS, uh, where he sometimes takes part in as a panelist in their annual program on cross-border issues. So it's a great pleasure to welcome Chris Kirkey to Triple E today. Welcome, Chris. Thank you, Beth. Uh, it's wonderful to be part of this series. Um, um, it's uh, when Beth reached out to me last year to see if I could speak as part of the Education Enrichment for Everyone series. I was absolutely delighted to say yes. Unfortunately, we have to do it through the guise of um, uh, remote delivery through Zoom today. But um, that being said, I'm very happy to join you on a glorious Friday afternoon. Um, I am just going to informally have a conversation with you today. Um, that focuses on uh, American foreign policy under President Trump toward Canada, because I think it's quite fascinating to see some of the contours of how that policy has emerged. And frankly, um, not only how it's emerged, but how we can expect it to, to continue to play out at least until January, if not beyond. Um, we don't know what the outcome obviously will be of the forthcoming presidential election, but uh, it's worth evaluating and examining what's gone on for almost the past four years. Um, I think everyone who pays close attention to the Canada-US relationship over the years knows quite honestly that we've had times um, very clearly when um, that relationship has been, if you will, um, nice and warm and cozy, if you will. There have been close personal relationships between prime ministers and presidents. We can look back to the 1980s and talk about the relationship between President Ronald Reagan and Prime Minister Brian Mulroney of Canada. We can look um, a little bit more recently at the relationship between President Bill Clinton and Prime Minister Jean Chrétien. Conversely, we also know that there have been periods when the US-Canada relationship has been cool you might say, or when relationships between presidents and prime ministers have been less than warm. And there's some obvious examples to point to here. Maybe the most noteworthy one was when Pierre Trudeau was prime minister of Canada and Richard Nixon, president of the United States. It's very clear that not only on a policy level and not only on an intellectual level, but more importantly, on a personal level, the two men just did not get along. Um, uh, President uh, George Bush and Prime Minister Jean Chrétien were not best friends by any stretch of the imagination. When Lester Pearson was Canada's Prime Minister in the 1960s um, and uh, uh, LBJ was President of the United States, I think um, many of you probably know that uh, in a speech at Temple University that the Canadian Prime Minister delivered, uh, if effectively criticizing American um, the American war effort in Vietnam, um, that went over like a lead brick with uh, uh, President Johnson. He was not at all happy and in fact uh, picked up Mr. Uh, Prime Minister Pearson by the lapel of his uh, suit jacket and lifted him off the ground and shook him um, at the White House uh, and uttered a very famous line which I'll hold off on today. Uh, but it was just, you know, a very blunt uh, um, statement sort of suggesting that he keep his opinions to himself. And even further back, you can look at the relationship between President uh, Kennedy and uh, Prime Minister John Diefenbaker, once again, not all that warm. Now, why do I bring this up at the outset of our conversation today? Well, I think it's important because when you do look back at the last four years and you look at sort of where 
um, American foreign policy has been going vis-a-vis -vis Canada. There's clearly, you know, the, the our current president, Donald Trump, has not left a, a positive impression with many Canadians. In fact, he's um, uh, publicly um, taken what you might call uh, an adversarial or a less than warm and rosy position on many occasions towards the Canadian Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau. Um, upon leaving uh, a G7 summit in Quebec a couple of summers back in June of 2018, uh, President Trump called the Prime Minister uh, very dishonest and weak. Um, and, um, uh, and that Trudeau was prone to false statements. Larry Kudlow, the president's economic chief economic advisor said that Trudeau had quote unquote stabbed us, meaning the United States in the back. Uh, Peter Navarro said, quote unquote, there's a special place in hell for Prime Minister Trudeau. So um, it seems on, you know, on the surface that American foreign policy under our current president is really uh, not exactly uh, uh, collegial, cooperative, warm and fuzzy towards our neighbor to the north. I want to suggest at the outset today that as antagonistic as that may sound, and it's empirically correct, um, the truth is that in order to understand, to explain and advance um, America's current foreign policy towards Canada, we have to recognize that President Trump's priorities and actions reflect uh, a broader approach towards engagement in the world at large. And I think that's, you know, where I'm going to start off. I'll talk a little bit, I'll do sort of four things this afternoon. I'll try and talk um, and discuss a little bit about this sort of worldview of the president, what's motivating his foreign policy. And as I'm suggesting, his approach toward Canada is not unique. It fits within a well-defined, broad worldview and approach toward the conduct of American foreign relations. Secondly, um, uh, I'll talk a little bit about how that relationship with Canada has played out on a couple of key issues, one of which is the North American Free Trade Agreement, sort of suggesting that everything in the world that's wrong with NAFTA uh, needed to be either fixed or dispensed with. And secondly, I'll talk about Canada's engagement with the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO, and some of the concerns that have been brought to light by the Trump administration there. And finally, I'll offer some conclusions and some suggestions for where we may be going forward. And then I'll be delighted to entertain any inquiries or questions that you may have. So um, with that being said, um, most observers uh, who are scholars or journalists and who are trying to explain President Trump's approach toward an application of American foreign policy um, toward Canada, they tend to focus on explanations that emphasize personal behavioral indicators or political calculations that the president makes that are squarely focused on the core priorities of his conservative base and also just his general lack of appetite for the complexities of foreign affairs. We know he's a self-described businessman and deal maker and it's true his view of foreign policy tends to be more practical and lean toward a model that focuses on outcomes rather than relationships and is geared towards short-term solutions, transactional solutions rather than long-term strategies. Um, it's fascinating to look at the sort of elbow room or flexibility that each and every president has had um, since the end of the Second World War, 1945, in terms of uh, implementing and choosing which options to move forward with on American foreign policy toward Canada. I think it's fair to say that in the world that we often call the Cold War or bipolar world from 1945 to the political dissolution of the Soviet Union at Christmas of 1991, that sort of period was a rough and tumble period for foreign affairs, but it was also a period in which every president um, in the United States had a pretty clear calculation as to what they, they wanted to do, and they were pretty circumscribed in terms of focusing on the Soviet Union and the threat that that's the Soviets and communism posed. Um, all of a sudden the world changed dramatically at Christmas of 1991 and every president since um, has had increased flexibility, increased, uh, they don't have to wake up in the morning and say, what is the Soviet Union up to and how are they gonna respond if I do X? 
that sort of basic calculation of foreign affairs has changed dramatically. Um, and it's changed dramatically. Um, uh, and we shouldn't at all be surprised. A lot of people will suggest, oh my gosh, this, you know, that President Trump is a little bit different than most political leaders who've come in in terms of their approach toward foreign policy. But what I'm trying to suggest is that we shouldn't be surprised that because the world in which presidents operate, we moved away from a, a world of two great powers and cold war to a world where there wasn't a cold war for a long stretch. And we may be transitioning to war one, towards one with China these days. But the truth of the matter is, um, you know, so we, we should have expected that at some point a president would come along and sort of look at the world that had been created post-1945. Look at that framework, look at the multinational, multilateral organizations, both security and economic, and sort of question, um, you know, uh, what America's role in that is. And frankly, um, President Trump has done that. Um, when you look at his engagement with the international community, it's very clear at its fundamental core, um, including his approach towards Canada. Trump's doctrine is driven by a political calculus that's grounded in the unwavering belief that American participation in the world is simply too expansive and too expensive. Um, and perhaps more to the point, the burden of leadership is not being fairly shared. So American commitments, most especially to existing institutionalized, as I said a moment ago, um, trade and security arrangements, such as the United Nations, the World Trade Organization, the G7, NATO, um, he believes, as they are currently constituted and as they currently operate, um, they serve the needs of other nations and not the United States. Um, costs are disproportionately and unfairly being underwritten by the United States, and this has to stop. Um, so as such, American foreign policy um, toward Canada and the greater world is above all else characterized by an unmistakable desire to correct these imbalances, if you will. Uh, and regardless of the issue, the actor, the institution, our president has been on an unrelenting campaign of orchestrating significant change in American foreign relations. Um, it's not complicated because he looks at international agreements as being counterproductive to American national interests. And you can go through a long laundry list. You can look at the Trans-Pacific Partnership. You can look at the Paris Climate Agreement. You could look at the Iran nuclear deal. You can look at the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty. We've all, all of these agreements have been dismissed or criticized, abandoned. And when you look at the list of nations where Trump has tried to reconfigure Washington's relationship with, it's, it's very noteworthy. I mean, look at this list, Russia, China, North Korea, Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Cuba, Israel, Syria, Egypt, Yemen, Turkey, Britain, France, Germany, Mexico, and yes, Canada. So American engagement in the international community under President Trump is more circumscribed um, and he's looking to have operations and expenses more equitably shared. So what about Canada? If this is the broader context of how we need to understand and approach America's foreign policy toward Canada. Um, what has it meant? Um, well, not surprisingly, the United States has, under the leadership of President Trump, sought to consistently redefine America's uh, relations in a way that allows the United States to pursue an America first strategy, even though this is being done with the United States' is closest ally and nearest neighbor. Um, in a period before the Cold War ended where exemptionalism and exceptionalism were the norm, these norms have been removed, um, they're off the table. Um, the style of diplomacy you might say in the current era is more in your face and less diplomatic. Uh, early, early in the current administration, there were multilateral um, uh, trade and security arrangements that were pointed to by President Trump, particularly when he was a candidate, and I'll speak to that in a moment, in 2016, that he argued forcefully that the White House needed to revisit and fix because there were too many bilateral arrangements in place with Canada that were just working 
to the advantage of Canada and not and 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 that the United States was being taken advantage of. Um, so we've had some interesting diplomacy between Washington and Ottawa. We've had, as I say, some really um, punctuated conversations, um, both by um, uh, bureaucrats, by political officials and others. Um, and there've been some very core disagreements. So I'd like to talk to you, if I can, over the next 10 or 15 minutes, a little bit about both uh, the North American Free Trade Agreement and the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. If I can turn to NAFTA and beyond and what would become of NAFTA, it's a fascinating story. I think, you know, most scholars, most political commentators, most journalists would tell you that up until the time President Trump came into office, that the issue of the 1994 North American Free Trade Agreement was really a non-politicized issue. It was the consensus amongst folks was that this was an arrangement, an agreement that was in many ways working to benefit all three countries, all three nations, the United States, Canada, and Mexico. Um, and it was working in different ways. Yes, had there been, because of comparatively lower labor rates and laxer environmental standards in Mexico, had there been a shift in manufacturing jobs from the American Midwest in particular toward Mexico, not only in the automobile industry, but in a variety of industries. Yes, that was clear. But had that been in some ways offset by uh, tremendous economic growth as a result of sort of free, um, uh, regularized transport of uh, goods and services uh, across all three borders in a way that allowed all three economies to expand, I think most people would say, yes, that has been the case. So it's interesting that he comes in, and this is not something that clearly the president invented in 2015 or 16. You can go back and see uh, longstanding footage uh, of uh, concerns that he had with uh, the way America's uh, trading relationships were working, including with Canada and specifically with NAFTA. So uh, I don't think we should, um, uh, think about uh, this as an outlier. This this concern about NAFTA was was there and, and remains. Um, in fact, uh, when you look at his platform, um, the president's platform, when he was running as the Democratic first as a candidate, uh, sure, sorry, Republican um, candidate, and then ultimately as the Republican Party nominee in 2016. He was making this America first promise and he pledged to would be voters that he would restore greatness to America, however that was defined, expanding the economy, strengthening the military and so on and so forth. He blamed among other things, unfair trade practices, cheap foreign labor and foreign friendly trade agreements as the key culprits in America's economic decline. He specifically targeted the TPP and NAFTA. Um, NAFTA was a regular target during campaign rallies. Indeed, during the presidential, I should say the Republican Party presidential primary, as the Republican presidential candidate and ultimately as president of the United States, he hammered and still does home the message that NAFTA was the most flawed international agreement ever crafted between nations. Um, NAFTA, the president observed during the first presidential debate he engaged in in September of 2016, September 26th, NAFTA, in his opinion, constituted, quote, the single worst trade deal ever approved in this country. Its terms and conditions, which I mentioned a moment ago, which date back to 1994, had systematically, in his view, worked to directly disadvantage and harm the United States while enriching Canada and Mexico. The latter, um, in the Mexican case, as I mentioned, because of lax or environmental standards, he suggested, and comparatively lower rates, um, was disproportionately injuring the American Manufacturing Society. Tens of thousands of working class plant employees had been terminated as companies relocated factory production to Mexico. Canada had, by benefiting from preferential access to the single largest national market in the world, namely the United States, developed healthy annual goods and services surpluses from its engagement with the United States. 
In addition, Canadians, Trump argued, embraced a protectionist approach in certain sectors, most notably with regard to dairy products, something near and dear to Vermont as well as to New York, that effectively made the import of American products too expensive or simply not possible. As President Trump would repeatedly observe in the course of press conferences, speeches, and most importantly, Twitter statements, NAFTA needed to be immediately renegotiated or jettisoned altogether. So um, he demanded that let's see what we can do to make this deal better. And frankly, negotiations unfolded in 2017. They were punctuated by periodic acrimonious exchanges between the president and the prime minister, senior officials, as I suggested, in Washington and Ottawa as well. And the negotiations would continue through September of 2018. And by late August of that year, significant progress had been realized to the point that the United States and Mexico announced that it had reached an agreement, a bilateral agreement, on revising key elements of NAFTA. Well, apart from the specific points of the agreement, the most notable feature of the accord was quite obviously the absence of Canada. The Trump administration was clearly at this stage motivated not only by a joint desire to have the outgoing Mexican president, President Nieto, sign the agreement before he left office on December the 1st, um, but they wanted very clearly to preemptively use this new bilateral arrangement as leverage against Canada to prompt Ottawa to demonstrate greater flexibility in the negotiations and ultimately agree to a trilateral arrangement. The question now was how would Canada respond? And the United States was very blunt, the White House was very blunt, and wasted no time in declaring the willingness of the United States to move on without Canada. Ideally, we'll have the Canadians involved, indicated Robert Lighthouser, the United States Stripe representative and the principal American negotiator with regard to NAFTA. If we don't have Canada involved, we will notify Congress that we have a bilateral deal and that Canada at a later date is free to join. President Trump was, um, honestly, he was decidedly less equivocal in his remarks. He took to Twitter on September the 1st of 2018 to declare, quote, there is no political necessity to keep Canada in the new NAFTA deal. If we don't make a fair deal for the U.S. after decades of abuse, uh, and that, that really stands out as probably the most vitriolic statement that an American president has hurled towards Canada, after decades of abuse, Canada will be out. Well, what I will tell you is that throughout the month of September 2018, seemingly little progress was being made. There was this negotiating deadline of September 30th coming up. And so the president decided to exercise greater pressure on the Canadian authorities to quickly reach an accord. And speaking on September the 26th, the president said, um, noted that he had refused to meet with Prime Minister Trudeau during the United Nations General Assembly sessions in the United States because Canada was quote unquote treating the United States very badly. Then he unveiled a direct threat. If Canada was unprepared, President Trump noted, to move expeditiously forward and conclude a new trilateral trade agreement, the United States would move to impose a significant new 25% tax on any car exported into the US from Canada. A move that if carried out, it was recognized would cause severe hardship. Um, and in Canada, especially in the province of Ontario, putting an estimated 250,000 people out of work. So this was, this was quite serious. Um, and it would obviously have a strong negative impact on the Canadian economy. As Trump said during the news conference, frankly, we're talking, we're thinking, about just taxing cars coming in from Canada. That's the mother load. That's the big one. We're very unhappy with the negotiations and the negotiating style of Canada. Um, he reaffirmed at the same time his intense dislike of NAFTA. Um, he said, I don't like NAFTA. I never liked it. It's been very bad for the United States. It's been great for Canada, great for Mexico. We're very well along with Mexico. The relationship's very good. 
We'll see what happens with Canada. They're charging us 300% tariffs on duty. We can't allow that to happen. Um, Canada responded, Prime Minister responded that very same day saying, we are working hard and will take as long as it is necessary to get the deal right for Canada. So in late September, it seemed like there was trouble afoot. Would they be able to successfully reconfigure this North American free trade agreement? Finally, um, after a weekend of intense video link negotiations between Washington and Ottawa, both parties reached agreement essentially on what are revisions to NAFTA and what we now call and title the United States, Mexico, Canada agreement, the USMCA. And that was formally um, wrapped up, if you will, on September the 30th. Um, what, did, what, what did the United States secure? Them? Why was it so important? Well, amongst other pr provisions, the accord satisfied Americans' concerns over access to the Canadian dairy market by allowing the U.S. to sell a greater range and volume of products to Canada. It allows for a significant increase in pharmaceutical patents. Um, it revamped the rules governing the manufacturing of automobiles in an effort to grow more automotive production jobs here in the United States. Canada received some things they wanted. Mexico received some things they wanted. And at the end of the day, President Trump came out and said, you know, this USMCA, um, he was quite happy to dispense with the NAFTA acronym and, and put the U.S. at the front of this, um, is, quote, a great deal for all three countries, he said on his Twitter account. When he spoke um, at a news conference in the White House Rose Garden, he underscored, quote, we had some very strong tensions. It was just an unfair deal, whether it was Mexico or Canada. And now it's a fair deal for everybody. It's a much different deal. It's a brand new deal. It's not NAFTA redone. Throughout the campaign, I promised to renegotiate NAFTA and today we have kept that promise. Like any important negotiation, we had to make some compromises, but today is a great day for the United States. Um, the USMCA, as many people know, um, was signed by the president, Prime Minister Trudeau and President Nieto of Mexico in Buenos Aires at an international summit meeting on November the 30th of 2018. Um, and at that time, the president observed, quote, we've worked hard on this agreement. It's been long and hard. We've taken a lot of barbs and a little abuse and we got there. Well, it's, I think most observers would point out that it's fascinating that, you know, um, as much as the president chose to take NAFTA, this longstanding trade arrangement with Canada, Mexico, and suggest that there were all these um, procedural and, and uh, shortcomings and in, in terms of its operational practices. Uh, the truth is that since the USMCA has been launched and formed, um, what was once politicized, meaning NAFTA is no longer politicized. It's no longer, I mean, the president will periodically come out and talk a little bit about this. Um, and quite honestly, um, um, but it's it's a point of of uh, it's a point of uh, celebration in some ways. I was, I was surprisingly last night that I, I anticipated during the presidential debate um, between President Trump and Joe Biden that we would hear from the president a little bit more because not so much that he would celebrate the USMCA, but in effect, sort of saying, "Look, you know, this NAFTA thing is just horrible." Um, anybody chose to leave that effectively alone last night. So um, I was thinking he was going to use that particularly to attract voters in the Midwest of the United States. Um, so let's turn, if we can, just briefly um, to talk about NATO and Canada and the concern that the Trump administration has had vis-a-vis -vis the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Now, I think everybody is well aware that the, the NATO formed in April of 1949 has been a military and political alliance that during the Cold War period was effectively uh, one of the two, well, it was, uh, it was the most important international alliance for helping to preserve peace in Europe and beyond um, uh, during this period of time. Um, and when Trump began to look at the operations of NATO and specifically Canada's engagement and contributions to NATO, from his perspective, 
um, it was and frankly still remains insufficient, although he's willing now, uh, as you've heard even briefly last night without uh, mentioning Canada, that NATO nations are making larger contributions. Um, he essentially, in very simple terms, has taken the position that Canada must do more with NATO. Um, it needs to commit additional financial resources. It needs to commit additional material resources to make sure that the alliance works well. Um, when he looked at what Canada had been doing, had been paying, um, you know, this was a source of concern. He said at a campaign rally in 2016, we're the schmucks paying for the whole thing. Many countries owe us a tremendous amount of money for many years when they're delinquent. And as far as I'm concerned, because the United States has had to pay for them. Um, when John Bolton was uh, working for the president, he noted in 2016 that what we're trying to do here, um, when you're talking about the NATO alliance, is making sure that it's not undermined and that we basically have um, a strong military um, commitment amongst all member states to NATO. Um, his first, President Trump, his first real public criticisms and demands that were leveled at Canada with regard to its NATO engagement uh, acutely surfaced in June and July of 2018. Um, there was about to be in July of 2018, a NATO summit in Brussels. And just before everybody arrived in Brussels to chat, um, and this was a you know clearly calculated preemptive measure on the part of the White House, the president on June the 19th dispatched letters to several leaders of uh, NATO member countries, including Canada's Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, exhorting Canada to do more for NATO. He noted that there was quote unquote, a growing frustration in the United States with regard to the alliance's underwriting commitments. He stated that the United States expected, quote, to see a strong recommitment by Canada to meet the goals to which we have all agreed in the Defense Investment Pledge. That pledge, by the way, was something that was set up in 2014 at a summit of NATO members in Wales, where all the signatories agreed to spend two, to move towards spending 2% of their GDP on NATO defense by 2024. Um, uh, or just, I shouldn't say to NATO, but just in terms of the general defense spending. And Canada's level of military spending was well known to Mr. Trump, was well known to um, American officials. And this is something that goes back years and years. I'm talking 50 years. You can go back and take a look at comments from various congressmen, from various secretaries of defense, and sometimes a secretary of state or even a president where there's some concern about the fact that Canada really isn't paying a lot, um, but never in a way that was as blunt as Mr. Trump would do here. Canada, for example, when you measure what they spend, um, um, you know, uh, towards NATO, that number percentage or real dollars uh, hasn't been much uh, in the sense that in 2018, the figures I have the most recently, um, Canada spent 1.23% of its GDP. On, on military defense spending. Um, and that ranked it, of course, with countries like Belgium and um, the Czech Republic, Hungary, Italy, Luxembourg, Slovenia, and Spain. So Trump was frustrated. So when he wrote to the prime minister, um, he said, you know, we appreciate what Canada has done by way of making commitments to NATO in places like Afghanistan and Iraq and Syria, but quote unquote, these do not excuse any of us from our commitments to ensure NATO has the resources it needs. Canada's continued defense spending of less than 2% undermines the security of the alliance and provides validation for other allies that are also not meeting their defense spending commitments. So how did Ottawa respond to this? They sort of had a sense this was coming um, because the current president is, is you know, somewhat fixated on, on sort of trying to revisit uh, trade and security arrangements and, and either dispense with them or revisit them and try and improve them. Um, so Canada, uh, you know, thinking about this, 
um, said, you know, we're going to do a couple of things. Um, and this was just basically on the cusp of the uh, July 2018 uh, NATO meeting in Brussels. So what Canada did um, was that they agreed to renew through 2023 and expand their manpower commitment. There's a NATO multinational group called Ford Presence. It's a battle group that's in Latvia. It's in the Baltics because of concerns about Russia principally. Um, and so Canada said, look, you know, not only will we increase our manpower commitment, but we'll agree, if you will, um, to continue leading this for four more years. And then at the summit itself in Brussels, Ottawa committed to assuming command of NATO's new multinational non-combat training and capacity building mission in Iraq for its first year of operations. And this meant um, about another 250 members of the Canadian forces and some additional uh, helicopters and, and different um, materials. So at the end of this, Trump sort of said, well, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, how do I feel about this when he was leaving Brussels? He was, uh, he didn't say he was happy, didn't say he was ecstatic, but, but welcomed, if you will, these positive steps that had been made by Canada. Um, and he believed that uh, he had successfully gotten states to move in the direction that he wanted them to move. In fact, when they left Brussels, um, uh, he, he basically focused on a key point, which was, or two, two key points, number one of which is he had gotten states, including Canada, or nations, including Canada, to move more in the direction of the 2%, and that that target of 2% be increased to 4%. So, um, so there you go on NATO. Um, so using these two examples, uh, what conclusions or what just general observations can we draw about American foreign policy towards Canada under President Trump? Um, and indeed, I'm tempted to ask, how will the remainder of his tenure as president be characterized when it comes to Americans, America's policy towards its northern neighbor? We don't know, quite frankly, um, yet. Um, we should in less than two weeks, with the hopefully with with less than two weeks, know what the outcome of the presidential election will be. But I would suggest to you whether the president is here for another two weeks, pardon me, well, through January rather, or secures another four years in office. I think that when we think of American foreign policy toward Canada, as long as President Trump is there, it's going to continue to be distinguished by efforts to advance American foreign interests through ongoing efforts to recraft existing and future arrangements, arrangements that favor American businesses and workers. Um, I don't think there's much uh, doubt about that. Colin Robertson, who's a well-known observer of the Canada-US relationship, worked at Canada's Department of Foreign Affairs for many years, was the number two at the Canadian Embassy in Washington and is an avid writer recently observed in the Globe and Mail that consistency in American policy and bipartisan support for alliances no longer applies. Canada and its allies need to adapt. Um, and I think that's, that's very clear. Um, in fact, I would suggest to you this afternoon that when most people once again are looking at America's foreign policy towards Canada and even more broadly the world, I think the thing that we need to think about is, yes, on the Canada front, there have clearly been some prickly situations that have emerged <laughs> and the warm and fuzzy relationship that has been in place on many occasions currently is not. Um, but I think that we need to understand that that is part of a broader worldview that this president takes to the conduct of American foreign relations. Um, I suppose the key question to ask this afternoon at the end is, what about the future of Canada-US relations? Is, are, are we gonna to continue to have this focus, this <coughs> focus rather, on um, what the former Canadian ambassador to Washington, Derek Burney, called the erratic American first impulses of Donald Trump? Are these gonna persist after he leaves the White House? Whenever that might be. Um, or um, are we gonna to return to a more um, regularized style of diplomacy? Well, it's clear that Canada can't alter its geography. Management of relations with the United States for Canada 
<laughs> will invariably be its predominant priority. Um, and that's very clear from the, from the uh, statements of the prime minister and uh, other party leaders in the Canadian cabinet. This is something that uh, Canada will have to, uh, by necessity, continue to focus on. I think most people are suggesting, and maybe I'll wrap up on this before turning to questions, because um, I know one of the questions that General Slee sent in was asking about how should Joe Biden be elected president? How would that impact the relationship with Canada? I think most observers are of the opinion that that would turn the relationship in a more positive direction, that the, the, the voices coming in, it's not to say that uh, it's going to be a love fest or anything, but the truth is that um, you have, um, you know, on an ideological basis, you have a president who is clearly um, uh, more conservative uh, in nature. You have a prime minister who's decidedly more liberal in nature um, in terms of not only party affiliations, but ideological predisposition. Um, so you have some, some differences there, whereas Joe Biden is clearly more, uh, more of a, a liberal and more of a centrist, more of a Democrat. And I think there'd be certainly more common ground between himself and the prime minister. They've had a very positive relationship in the past. Um, and uh, Joe Biden had a very positive relationship, not only uh, when he served in the, in the Congress, but, um, but served as President Obama's vice president toward Canada. Um, so uh, my guess is that, you know, if there is a change in January, that change will be for a, a more positive direction in the relationship. Um, and now I, I'll wrap up and I don't know, I think Beth may be asking me questions or how do you want to proceed from here? I'm delighted to answer the questions that have come in the chat room. So we discussed that uh, I will be asking the questions. That That's fine, up. Bjorn. Sure. Yep. So the first one is, do you see a day when Canada becomes a republic? And if so, what would that mean for Canada-US relations, if any? It's a very interesting question. Um, first part of the question, do I foresee a date? I don't. And part of the reason for that is despite the fact that there are at times strong differences in the Canadian political federation um, between Ottawa and the various provinces in particular, uh, most notably Quebec and sometimes uh, uh, if I, uh, Alberta. Alberta in the sense there's a long-standing tradition in the Canadian political system of Western regional alienation. In the case of Quebec, there have been episodes that go back starting in the late 60s um, with the advent of the Quiet Revolution in the 1960s through till recently where you've had two flirtations with referendums and two um, uh, opportunities where uh, Quebec is considered uh, sovereign status within Canada, separate status, if you will, political separation. Um, so I don't see that happening um, anytime soon because separation is no longer a burning issue in Quebec. And I think the forces, the concerns that Alberta have is very obvious. If you look at Canada, 338 seats in the Canadian House of Commons, over roughly 200 of those are in the province of Ontario and Quebec. So Alberta was not feeling part of the you know, at least structurally uh, deficient, if you will, in terms of uh, representation. So it's a concern. And Bjorn, what was the second part of the question, please? What would that mean if Canada would become a republic with a big if there? What would that mean for Canada-US relations, if any? Yeah, I don't think we need to worry about it. This is the simple answer, the straightforward answer, so. Next question. Uh, so, and this is not me saying it, I'm just reading the question. When I was growing up in St. John, New Brunswick, we used to say that when the U.S. sneezes, Canada catches a cold. How would you characterize that adage now? I think that adage is maybe a bit out of date, which is to suggest that Canada doesn't catch a cold anymore. Um, I think Canada's economy um, is... Uh, uh, considerably stronger than it once was. That's not to say that the disproportionate share of its exports uh, continue to go to the United States. They're not as high as they once were, almost teetering, if you can believe this, on 90%. It's more in the 75% ballpark now. Um, 
Um, and Canada has clearly some work to do. It needs not only to diversify its trade markets, but build up its internal trade market by taking down so many regulatory barriers to interprovincial trade. Um, so um, I, I don't quite think that's the case. Canada was not as, as robust a country as it once was economically, demographically, politically, um, socially. I, I think it's much stronger than it once was. So here's a little longer question. Although the relationship between the Canadian and US heads of government is currently strained, there are many close and long-standing ties between Canadian provinces and US states. Does this bode well for future relations with Canada, one of our most important allies? The answer is absolutely yes, it does. I mean, the range of connections, family, business, social, um, political between various American states and Canadian provinces and territories is vast. It's always been part of the fabric that's held the glue of Canada and the United States relationship together, and that hasn't changed. Um, and fortunately, if anything, it's it's expanded over time. So no, I, th that's that's really you know um, an absolutely. And I thank you very much for bringing that to my attention because I've sort of know I've talked about federal to federal relations here, but that provincial state relationship, including Vermont's relationship, for example, with most notably Quebec, um, but also Ontario and other places uh, is pivotal. pivotal. How is the USMCA working out for Canada? So far, so good, they would tell you. Um, you know, uh, that there have been voices of concern in the province of Quebec in particular regarding the new provisions, new dairy provisions in the agreement and what it means for increased competition from, but we haven't, I think it's fair to say, if you go into a, if you were able to cross the border and you were able to go into a grocery store, a Provigo, for example, or a Metro in the province of Quebec, you'd find that and you walked into the dairy section. Uh, it's not like there's been a tremendous change in the, range of products or in the availability of American dairy products yet. Um, that will take some time, um, um, but uh, it, it's something that I think Canadians would say they're fine with. That Their biggest concern in these renegotiations was making sure that whatever emerged, something emerged, because Canada needs to have that preferential access to its largest market. Could you please comment on what appears to be a recent upsurge in protest activism and demands for justice by First Nations people in many parts of Canada? Wonderful question. A lot of people look at the issue as much as the United States, one of its principal, if not its principal source of societal cleavage is race. Uh, in Canada, it's, um, it's treatment of Indigenous peoples. Um, and quite honestly, this is a uh, an issue that really gained a lot of traction in the last 12 or 15 years. Various prime ministers, Paul Martin, um, Stephen Harper, now Justin Trudeau have promised to address this. There was an important uh, Truth and Reconciliation Commission that went on for several years in Canada, looking at Canada's formal, uh, former rather, policy of residential schools where they would take children away from um, their families and move them south uh, to uh, a residential school system in which uh, so horribly that so much abuse took place um, amongst uh, these poor children. And frankly, um, that Truth and Reconciliation Commission, I believe in 2014 or 15, issued 94 recommendations. The Prime Minister, this was before his Prime Minister, immediately embraced all 94, but it's clear that you know some of these are small. Um, like, you know, we need to have, uh, as we all know with Lake Champlain, you need to have clean drinking water, you know, um, and uh, you, you don't want to have to go and boil your water 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, you know, you want to have access to better health care. You want to have access to job opportunities. And it's, it's going to remain, I think the simplest way to put it is the government has made some um, positive step forwards. Uh, the chief of the Assembly of First Nations in Canada says Prime Minister Justin Trudeau has done more for the Indigenous peoples of Canada than any former Prime Minister. Um, and the truth is there's so much more to be done and it will remain front and centre as the issue in Canada um, as a po point of societal cleavage. Yes. So this is a follow-up question. 
Is this seen as a threat to Canada's national unity and security? Very good question. Um, I don't think it is. It could well have been had this pandemic not come along. But I think if you talk to the average Canadian or you read the average Canadian newspaper or watch the average Canadian news broadcast, you'll see that um, this is a country even more so than the United, far more so than the United States that have collectively come together and are collectively consumed by a desire to effectively address um, uh, the pandemic threat of COVID-19. So that's not to say that Indigenous issues won't go away, but rather it's sort of um, taking a bit of a, uh, a second, second row or of a, a back burner, if you will, um, to, the, to the needs of the pandemic at the current time. Is the USMCA treaty an improvement over NAFTA from US perspective and from Canada's perspective? It's a great question. Um, I think that if, if you were to compare the two side by side, there was there were clearly some um, clearly some uh, updates given the passage of time since 1994 that brought the treaties terms and conditions up to speed. Um, and I think that quite honestly, the simple answer is yes. I think there are provisions in there that benefit the United States and there are provisions in there that Canada, it may not have advanced what Canada wanted, but at least retained what Canada wanted. Um, so that there were some, you know, things that Canada just was not willing to give in on. Um, so I think, you know, it's one of those things that uh, you would, is it mutually optimal uh, for these two partners? No. But was it mutually satisfactory? The answer is yes. Comment on relations between U.S. and Canada during the Obama administration. Sure. I think it's fair to say that during that period of time, we had um, a pretty warm uh, relationship, despite the fact that you had a prime minister who was clearly a conservative prime minister, Stephen Harper. Uh, and... Um, uh, Barack Obama as president of the United States, who in terms of the conduct of American foreign policy um, and its relationship with Canada, it's a bit different um, um, than obviously the pathway chosen by a conservative prime minister in Canada. Um, but during that period, th there were issues that came up, um, quite honestly, uh, in terms of uh, certainly not with NAFTA and certainly not with NATO, but, but some other issues in terms of Canada's engagement, continued engagement in Afghanistan as part of a, I should say, part of that NATO mission. Um, but for the most part, um, the, the relationship was positive, decidedly positive. Prime Minister Trudeau has recently faced several ethical challenges. How long do you uh, foresee him being in office? The ethical challenges that, uh, and I appreciate you bringing that to my attention this afternoon. Some of those challenges were, you know, um, heading into the last election, there were clear uh, evidence that the Prime Minister had acted in a racially insensitive, insensitive manner by donning blackface or brownface at times. Uh, he was also dogged by scandals about a Quebec, uh, one of the world's largest engineering companies based out of Montreal, SNC-Lavalin. Um, there were concerns that they had overcharged dramatically for work in, in, in Libya and that uh, uh, there was going to be some, uh, there was a judicial proceeding going on and that um, the prime minister intervened uh, with regard to two two. Well, one in particular, uh, cabinet minister, she actually resigned, a second cabinet minister also resigned um, to try and work out a deal with SNC-Lavalin or for SNC-Lavalin. So it was a sort of political uh, interference or intervention in what was going to be a judicial process. And also there was some concern, quite honestly, with regard to um, a, something called the We Charity in terms of the possibility, well, that it's clear the numbers show it that the prime minister's family, particularly um, uh, his mom and brother, were were being paid for appearances and things like that. And we had secured a very large contract last summer from the federal government to run a student program during the pandemic. That was subsequently cancelled and so on. But um, I think the prime one of his jobs right now as prime minister, because there's sort of no time clock. Uh, no term limit on how long you can be prime minister if the Canadian public 
decides to reelect your party and you're the leader of that party, you, know, you become the prime minister if you've got a majority or even in some cases that they currently have a minority government. Um, so he wants to rehabilitate his image in a more uh, public way that will, will, will uh, result in greater support. So this is a follow-up question. If the new opposition leader O'Toole were to become prime minister, how would this likely impact Canada's relationship with the U.S.? Well, Aaron O'Toole, who recently became the leader of the Conservative Party of Canada, which has the second largest number of seats in the Canadian House of Commons and forms uh, Her Majesty's loyal opposition, um, is sort of an unknown figure in Canada. If you ask most Canadians who this gentleman is and what he stands for and how he impacts the Canadian, or I should say the Conservative Party platform, most people won't know. Quite honestly, it's true. It's still too early. If Mr. O'Toole were to become at some point Canada's prime minister, if there's a general election called, um, uh, I don't think, um, uh, from what I understand, that it would have a, a consequential impact on the direction of the relationship one way or the other. Um, although Canada now has a spike in COVID cases, in general, it has fared much better than the U.S. Why is this? I hope you have hours for me to explain this, but we were fortunate a few weeks ago here at the Center for the Study of Canada to have, as part of our Zoom conversations like you're doing, we have a series called Conversations on Canada, and Andre Picard, who's a good friend of mine, Andre is the national columnist for the Canadian newspaper, The Globe and Mail on health, uh, has done terrific reporting on this subject um, and talked to us that day about, you know, what's gone on in Canada, what's gone on in the U.S., why is Canada seemingly fared uh, much better than the U.S.? Part of it, quite simply put, as he explains it, um, is that Canada started earlier, um, that there was the, 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 the process of addressing as he puts it, the, um, the healthcare challenges associated with the COVID-19 uh, pandemic were never politicized in Canada. This never became a political football, a political issue. Um, in fact, as he points out, you know, you have strong ideological differences between various premiers of provinces and, the, and, and Prime Minister Trudeau, but all the provinces, the territories, and the federal government were all on the same page. They were united in terms of the need to place this issue number one, not, you know, notwithstanding concerns about keeping economies moving along and so on and so forth, but this never became a political football. Everybody, there was a strong and remains a strong consensus in Canada, uh, unlike in the United States, that everybody needs to wear masks. And I'm not just talking about, you know, if you're going into a store, I'm talking about if you're out walking on the street, um, uh, people understand six feet apart means six feet apart. Um, and that um, you've got to wash your hands and you've got to, you know, maintain proper hygiene. Uh, and when I talk to family and friends who live in Canada, they're amazed. They're amazed at how lax uh, the typical American is uh, towards this whole thing. They, they, they really um, find it to be really disturbing. Um, and, and that may be a bit of a generalization, but the fact is, is that um, Canada has done, uh, plus the government has gotten squarely behind, the federal and provincial governments squarely behind and worked together to develop and to make sure that there was and is sufficient amounts of protective equipment um, and, and that hospitals have what they need. So, you know, it's, uh, in, in some ways you can say, well, why is all this? And you could simply say, well, you know, if you look back to what the founding sort of principles of the two nations are, what does Canada say to its citizens? It says it's gonna give you peace, order, and good government. It takes a very collective response, a collective approach to dealing with um, everything north of the border. What do you, what are you promised? What, what, what's the sort of foundational principles in the United States? Well, it's, you know, it's, um, you go back to the Declaration of Independence, you go back and you look at, it's, you know, it's, it's your rights, and it's your liberty, it's your freedom. Um, it's a very individual rights approach. Um, so you should expect to have somebody in one town or city or in a different state with a different governor sort of saying, oh, you know, these mass things, eh, you know, I'm not so sure. Um, whereas somebody says, oh yeah, you need them. 
Um, so I think that that's part of the reason Canada's done, at least to this point, uh, considerably better. Christopher, thank you so, so much. This was very educational, loved it. You're welcome, Carol. Carol. Do, I have a chance, yes. do I have a chance to answer one more quick uh, response? Super quick. Okay, this is from Beth. She wanted to know, you see a painting over my shoulder um, in my office here uh, in Plattsburgh and she was wondering about that. When I moved here in 2002, I'm not an abstract or contemporary paint, paint, uh, painter lover, I, I recognized this painting right away. And it was in the foyer where, you know, the wind and the cold were getting to it and it wasn't protected. And I recognized who it was and, and that it was quite valuable um, in the sense that it, this is a piece that could hang in the National Gallery of Canada. It's painted by a Canadian painter called William Ronald. It's a six figure painting and nobody knew that. And I was like, what is this doing here? Let's get this out of here. So I'm, although I, I'm, I have a different taste in, art style, uh, uh, I really uh, recommend it and, and, and recognize the need to protect this kind of stuff. So anyway, thanks for asking that fun question. And it, if I can, thank you all, whoever's here today. Thank you all. It's been a really wonderful chance to speak with you today. Thank you. Well, thank you.